So today I thought that it would be nice to give a short informative session and bring you some maybe mini series on various colored gems. And I thought it would be nice to cover tourmaline as one of the first ones, simply because it's quite a fascinating gem and it's a well-loved material in any gem circle. So let's take a look at the history of tourmaline. So some of the earliest discoveries include a Spanish conquistador who found green tourmaline crystals in Brazil in the 1500s. And at that time, they believed them to be emeralds. Then this gem was discovered again by Dutch traders off the west coast of Italy, and that was in the late 1600s or 1700s. And at those times, the green tourmalines were assumed to be emeralds because the science of gemology was not so well developed. And it wasn't until the 1800s that scientists realized that tourmalin was a species in its own. A great deal of tourmalin comes from the island of Sri Lanka, and its name is actually derived from the Ceylonese term tourmali. It's a term applied to multicolored water-worn pebbles that miners found in the gem gravels in the Sri Lankan rivers. And we are very lucky to have been to Sri Lanka and to have looked and, and panned for these water-worn pebbles ourselves. You can see here some very interesting types and all the colors of the rainbow, as you can see. Some interesting reds, really beautiful, and just little pebbles. Of course, once these are converted into gems, um, there's a lot of waste. In fact, we lose maybe 40 to 60%, so we would end up with quite small gems on those. But that being said, these, are, these beautiful tourmalines are found in the rivers and streams, and um, in the island of Sri Lanka, there are so many that are still being found there. Now, the label was very indicative of how difficult it was in earlier days to distinguish tourmalin from other gems. So with limited knowledge, quite often the reds were thought to be ruby, pinks were thought to be pink sapphires, and the greens were all thought to be emeralds. And just as has happened with other similar colored materials, like, for example, spinel, Tourmaline has been mistaken for practically every other popular gem in history. Even the Russian crown jewels contained red tourmaline, believed to be rubies for centuries. One such pendant was known as the Caesar's ruby, but it was a beautiful rubellite tourmaline. Another early report um, of tourmaline discoveries was in California around 1892 and tourmaline became known as an American gem through the efforts of Tiffany & Company gemologist George F. Kuntz, who loved and promoted tourmaline as a special collector's gem. Around the same time, tourmaline was popular in China, and it was prized and admired by Dowager Empress Cixi, who ruled from 1860 until 1908. She bought mostly the pink material from the mines in California, where it was carved and then worn by the imperial court and examples of beautiful Chinese snuff bottles are still displayed prominently in museums today. Tumlin is actually a birthstone for October. And traditionally it was opal, and it still is opal, also aquamarine, coral, beryl, but since 1912, the National Association of Jewelers decided to actually simplify the set of gems to use in birthstones. And of course, opal became the most well-known for October. Then in 1952, some additions and changes were made, including tourmaline, so as to have more options to choose from and less costly alternatives for everyday wearing. Now, if we talk about locations or sources, Brazil has certainly yielded some of the largest um, pieces and has had large deposits during the first half of the 20th century. And almost every color has been found there. After which, from the 15, 1950s, excuse me, um, many sources 
can be cited with Madagascar, Afghanistan, producing many of the fine red specimens as well. And there are active mines in Australia, uh, Burma, um, Canada, and also the island of Elba in Italy. India has produced tourmaline, Monrovia, Mozambique, Namibia, Nepal, Nigeria, Pakistan, Kenya, Russia, Siberia in the Ural Mountains, uh, even Sweden, Switzerland, Tanzania, and Thailand. So all of these places we can find beautiful tamalins. And since the late 1980s, new additions have been found uh, from the Paraiba area in Brazil. Now, this is very special because uh, we are going to dedicate an entire session later to the Paraiba tourmaline. It is very, very rare, and it's something that a lot of people, a lot of collectors are looking for today. So I'd like to now talk a little bit about colors. And as mentioned, um, tourmalines come in a wide variety of hues. So here is a very nice example of every shade of green, and then we have yellows, we have reds, pinks, purples, blues, um, absolutely every color you can possibly imagine, every shade. Not only that, but the red is the most desirable color, which they like to call rubellite. There are some very strong pinks, like bubblegum pink, which is really appreciated. There are also purplish reds, orangey reds, brownish reds. Some of the violetish reds look very much like ruby, which is why they call them rubellite. We have um, one of my favorites, which is indicolite. This comes in violetish blue to look like sapphire. And it can also come in a more teal blue or greenish blue hue. And all of these can range in tone from very dark as you can see here, super dark colors sometimes where you can only see the color by putting the pen light through it. I'll just show you this one a second. It looks super dark, but when you put the light through it, you can really see the intensity of color in that stone. Now, if you learn a little bit about what to look for in a gem material, you'll find that the dark uh, tone is not something that um, adds value, it actually detracts from the beauty of the stone. So try not to buy stones that are too dark. But some tourmalines have um, an amount of a green or blue color in them, which is very attractive. And these colors can be super strong and vivid. And sometimes they can even be less saturated and sometimes even grayish. So if we compare these two together, you will see that one has a very vivid color and the other has a very grayish uh, look to it. And so this means that the better the color, the more valuable the material. Even though the material is smaller, it's actually more expensive. Yes. Green tourmalines. They can be intense green. Sometimes they're called chrome green. And that's because the chrome green tourmalines are the closest to emeralds. However, it's very interesting to note that um, they're not always colored by chrome, even though chromium is typically the um, impurity that produces the green color in emeralds. Uh, most of the tourmalines are colored from vanadium. And the other greens, there are all kinds of greens, every shade that you can imagine, they are all a much lower, uh, lower option, a lower cost option to um, the emerald itself. So typically the greens tend to be very strongly pleochroic. Now this means that they can exhibit more than one color when you're looking from different directions. And so um, the gems can be very attractive when they're cut correctly. And if they're cut in the right manner, then they're going to show the best color. And then of course we have the bicolor and the party color tourmalines that have two or more colors within the same crystal. Typically, they can be green going to pink or red. Those are common, as well as the green going to blue. But exciting other combinations have been found as well. So it's not only the greens to reds or the greens to pink. 
And another favorite of mine is the watermelon tourmaline. And this really falls into a category of its own. Um, usually they are uh, red in the core of the crystal. And again, here we have a beautiful sample of a necklace that has been created with the watermelon tourmalines. You can see that the core of the crystals are very pink. And then around the core, we have the colorless. And then we have the green around that, which is the outer section of the crystal. Um, sometimes it can happen in the opposite direction. It can happen that we have green as the core and the pink or the red and on the outside of the crystal. But in general, this is why it's called the watermelon, because it looks very much when you slice a watermelon, it looks like sliced watermelon. And uh, it's difficult to find it when it's really clean and clear. Uh, many of these uh, materials tend to be highly included. So let me talk a little bit now about clarity, because when we talk about inclusions, um, some gems can actually be separated into single categories of eye clean or loop clean or eye visible. And that means that they would have eye visible inclusions very commonly present. Uh, this is not the case for tourmaline. You will find that they fall into every category depending on which color. Typically blues and green colors will usually fall into the eye clean range. If they're reds or pink colors, they can commonly have eye visible inclusions. A bit like emerald. Emerald typically has inclusions, especially the Colombian emerald. Uh, Zamian em emerald can be quite clean. So most gem buyers that know tourmaline, they're going to consider the color to be the dominant factor and they'll be less concerned with clarity. But when you have greens and blues that have eye visible inclusions, then this will definitely lower the value of the gems. So obviously the less uh, obvious the inclusions are, the more valuable the gem will be. Now inclusions tend to be much more visible in light toned gems or gems that have maybe weak saturation of color. Um, so these tend to be a lot less sellable and included gemstones which have good color, are typically cut into something we call cabochon. And the cabochon is a smooth, domed, facetless style of cutting where they become much more attractive. Because tourmalin typically grows in an environment rich in liquids, it is possible for the liquids to be captured as inclusions during the crystal growth. Now, these form some of the most interesting and common inclusions that look like little tubes running through parallel to the length of the crystal. And when these types of inclusions are well defined, the type of material is also cut in cabochon because it can produce a very valuable phenomenon known as the cat's eye effect. And these stones can actually be quite interesting and have become very much collector's items as well. What about cut and tourmalins? Well, they're found in all kinds of shapes, but the most common would be the rectangular shape due to the original shape of the rough crystal, which tends to grow quite long. Therefore, typically narrow and non-standard sizes are widely available. Tourmalin is a strongly pleochroic gem, which means that it can show colors in different crystal directions. So one of tourmaline's pleochroic colors is typically much darker than the other. And in addition, many tourmalines absorb light down the length of the crystal rather than across it. So a crystal that appears pale green across its width can be very dark green, sometimes even almost black, when you look down its length. Rather than cutting every tourmaline lengthwise, many cutters will orient a fashion gem based on its depth of color. So to darken pale rough, they might orient the gem's table so that it's perpendicular to the crystal's length. To lighten dark rough, they're gonna orient a finished gem's table so that it's parallel to the crystal's length. So this way it's possible and not unusual 
to find tourmaline cut into cushions, ovals, emerald cuts, occasionally trillions and fancy shapes, including pears, briolet, uh, hearts, and even navets. When it comes to tourmaline's durability, it's rated at a 7 to 7.5 on the Mohs scale of hardness. And this is considered perfectly wearable for daily use. They are usually stable, withstanding things like strong light and most chemicals. Um, but do keep them away from heat, as that can sometimes cause damage to a good gem. And when it comes to your care and cleaning of these gems, the standard cleaning with warm soapy water and a soft brush, um, as we have on our YouTube video, is a good thing to follow. You know, as most gems and jewelry can be cleaned that way, try to avoid the use of ultrasonics or steam cleaners as those can cause a lot of issues. Remember that ultrasonics have vibrations and heat and also the steam cleaners will have quite a bit of heat so they can do damage. So if you have equipment, make sure that you know how to use it and um, be safe and make sure it's safe for your gems. Lastly, I'd like to just mention treatments because most tourmaline is not really treated. A few might be exposed to low temperature heating, maybe to light and very dark stones. And it has been said that some rubellite might be irradiated but it's almost impossible to detect even with advanced gemological equipment. So treatment-wise, we don't expect uh, tourmalines to be treated in many different ways. Thank you everyone for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed seeing a little bit of my collection and uh, I would love you to share. If you like gems, share this with friends that like gems and consider subscribing to our channel as well because we have lots of very uh, useful and relevant information on all kinds of jewelry and gem related topics.